Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in this RedGamingTech.com video, we're going to be discussing as well as analysing tech news, which, as usual, has popped up in the past 24 or so hours. Hopefully, you're having an amazing day. I want to start this video out with AMD's ray tracing support concerning their next generation graphics cards. As you are likely aware, the RX 6000 series brings with it a myriad of feature set improvements over the first generation of RDNA, variable rate shading support, but perhaps the headliner was ray tracing. But there hasn't been exact clarification of which games did support ray tracing, although it was implied it would be the vast majority of games, and this is apparently confirmed by the folks over at Adored TV. AMD issued them a fairly short but, well, insightful statement. I'll read it verbatim. Their article, however, will be linked, of course, in the video description. AMD will support all ray tracing titles using industry-based standards, including the Microsoft DXR API and the upcoming Vulkan ray tracing API. Games making use of proprietary race tracing APIs and extensions will not be supported. So what does this actually mean? Well, in a nutshell, if this statement is accurate, and you would assume that it is, from as it's from AMD, games such as Control will work basically right out the gate on the RX 6000 series. I imagine some developers will opt to release a patch. This is obviously going to be dependent upon the developer, which may optimize things, and I suspect that performance because of that may improve slightly, but a game like Control should work just absolutely flawlessly. Same thing with any other game which uses DXR or um, any Vulcan title. Oh, and as a side note, I recently interviewed Neil Trevitt, um, and we actually discussed Vulcan quite extensively. He's uh, one of the head honchos over at the Kronos Group, so it's a pretty cool interview. I'll try to remember to link it in the video description. But there are some games which will not work on the RX 6000 series in terms of ray tracing. A really obvious candidate there would be Quake 2 RTX, as well, NVIDIA essentially created a lot of the work there. So it makes sense that it would not run on an AMD card. And Wolfenstein Youngblood, I believe, is kind of similar as well. Uh, it actually uses uh, some of proprietary technology from NVIDIA, I think. Um, I might be wrong on that, but I believe it does. So it does mean that, technically speaking, there's not a billion ray tracing games on the PC already, so you're going to have access to even a smaller number of those, a smaller subset. However, in the long term, most developers will probably implement things via either, um, I imagine anyway, DXR, or they'll do it via Vulkan ray tracing. So I think in the long run, AMD support should be absolutely okay. It's going to be very interesting to see how the performance is between the AMD and NVIDIA cards. Um, it's a bit of a shame that we can't run something like Quake 2, given, of course, it's essentially using for, uh, full path tracing, but there are other opportunities to test. Switching from one piece of AMD news to another, although we are still on the subject of graphics cards, kind of, from RDNA 2 to CDNA, which is a compute-based architecture. This is something that will not necessarily be in your home PC. Instead, this is for servers. But it does represent a very key marketplace for AMD, because obviously NVIDIA, in terms of uh, acceleration for AI and so on, has really been re relatively uncontested, although there are still players which are coming into the fray, including Intel. There is a fascinating discovery by Arraged, hopefully I pronounced that correctly, um, I'll link again the article in the video description, and apparently we will actually see AMD disclose more details on the MI100, or once again, uh, you can think of this as the CDNA architecture, although it used to be more commonly referred to as Arcturus. This architecture 
will apparently be revealed um, in just a few days from now. It's going to be uh, November the 16th. And it actually is quite interesting because it was actually revealed in the October edition of the AMD Corporate Identity book. And you can basically download this from the website from AMD for their partners. Um, there appears to be three models. The MI100, which we believe is the flagship product, and there's also the Instinct V640 and the V620. And of course, you can mix and match those together as you are most likely aware, for example, uh, we've seen some evidence that you can have four or even eight of these uh, MI100s uh, in one system, obviously to create different nodes and compute-based scenarios depending on uh, the data center slash uh, task that you're trying to achieve as well as, of course, your budget. These accelerators are not GPUs in the classical sense. So they do not have the ability to even display an image. They literally lack the ability to even output a rendered image. These are, again, specifically designed for compute-focused architectures. And this actually um, has been AMD's plan for quite a long time, to split, to bifurcate their architecture, have one architecture, RDNA, specif specifically, excuse me, designed around gaming, and CDNA, which obviously is compute focused for machine learning and so on. And this is going to compete with, at least according to the little information that AMD have publicly disclosed, as well as leaks, it's going to very much compete with AMD's uh, rival NVIDIA's top end cards. This method of uh, bifurcating the architecture on honestly makes an awful lot of sense and it kind of continues the legacy of Vega which obviously was really good at compute but then refines the graphics architecture to be specifically revolving around gaming and back in March of last year um, I actually did uh, put out a video where a couple of my sources had told me that AMD were going to do this that they were going to have an ASIC which was a lot more focused on compute and I think this approach was great because I think it helps to uh, fix uh, AMD's kind of uh, lack of uh, graphics performance in terms of optimizing for raw uh, frame rate and at the expense of a higher power consumption. Instead, the architectures are basically designed from the ground up for specific strengths. While we are still on the subject of AMD, I'm also going to throw something kind of interesting into the mix, and it's Godfall. Um, the developers recently put out a free four-minute video, and they were detailing some of the technology which is inside of Godfall, including ray-traced shadows, Fidelity FX, FreeSync support, um, and we also have support for CAS, uh, which is Contrast Adaptive Sharpening, which I think looks kind of cool. This title is going to be a launch title for the PlayStation 5, so it's a console exclusive, but it also um, will be on the PC as well, so you can purchase it through like Epic Game Store or whatever. And Keith Lee was recently speaking kind of at length about this, and he did mention that uh, the game does benefit from things like DirectX ray tracing on PC, variable rate uh, shading on PC. Obviously, PlayStation 5 has its own API, and the PC uh, uses DirectX. I mean, technically, they could have used Vulkan, but either way. And Counterplay games also, again, mention things such as Fidelity FX. But there is a really interesting little quote where he mentions that um, the architecture of the uh, AMD GPU is absolutely brilliant for Godfall being able to crank up all of the quality settings. For one reason, the Infinity Cache uh, helps to um, offset the high bandwidth demands of the game running at such high quality settings. But second, they were saying that it can use like 12 gigabytes of VRAM if they're using the ultra high quality texture setting, which is 4K by 4K. 
So obviously the fact that the RX 6000 series, at least the cards, the top end cards that we know about so far, they feature 16 gigabytes of memory. The rumor, to, from what I understand anyway, is the 6700 cards uh, and below will not feature this. I've heard that the 6700 XT uh, and below is going to be like 12 gigabytes or less, uh, but I've already reported on that previously. So what I'm trying to say is it's going to be very interesting to test this on a card such as the RTX 3080, given that it's only got 10 gigabytes. Now, it is worth noting that we don't currently have independent tests for this, and this game is sponsored by AMD. So just like when a developer phrases um, a NVIDIA architecture, an Intel architecture, or whatever, you do need a couple of pinches of salt because, well, at the end of the day, they are kind of uh, praising the architecture or, you know, the sponsor of the title. Uh, a little bit like we saw with like NVIDIA Gameworks implementations and stuff like that. With that said, um, you do need to take into consideration that just because a game actually um, allocates a large portion of VRAM, it doesn't necessarily mean that it will use it all. But with that said, it does remind me of games such as uh, Doom 3, if you remember, there was a quality setting on that thing. I can't remember what the quality setting was, but what it was called, like um, like ultra textures or something like that. Anyway, that thing like had a requirement of 512 megabytes of texture RAM, and back then, cards often shipped with 128 megabytes as standard, and some cards... Some cards had 256. So basically, um, the higher quality texture setting, which I can't remember the name of, so I'll just call it 512, uh, I believe the biggest difference was that it had uncompressed textures. I don't remember offhand what differences it made in terms of visual quality, but still, uh, obviously, it was rather demanding, and it, just, it wasn't a good thing to enable that on a 128 megabyte card. I'm pretty sure I tried that on my, like, Radeon 9800 Pro, I think I tried that on, and it, yeah, it didn't go so well. Um, yeah, but um, we can only wait and see on this. I mean, hopefully... It won't need 12 gigabytes because it, if it does for like ultra high quality textures, it's going to mean a crap ton of cards are out of the running. And you also should look at the fact that the recommended setting uh, hardware for running this game, um, it was recommending cards such as the 5700 XT. But we'll know in a few days anyway when the game actually officially launches and we can do testing on it to see whether it actually does make any difference. However, I will say that aesthetically, the game does look incredibly pretty, at least in my opinion. I don't necessarily know if it's my type of gameplay, but in terms of aesthetics, it looks amazing. And I want to finish off with just a few short stories. The first is a photo, an alleged photo, of Rocket Lake which of course is going to be the 11th generation processors. This was posted by Wing um, on Facebook, so full credit to him. I'll link the post in the video description. This naturally is still on the LGA 1200 socket, and Intel have confirmed previously that it will launch next year. It's looking like it's going to be late-ish first quarter, like February or uh, March first quarter, and Rocket Lake utilizes the Cypress Cove core architecture as well as uh, XELP graphics. So it also is notable because it's PCIe 4, um, which means that Intel won't be behind, at least in the generation of PCIe it supports. And also this processor will work on socket 400, sorry, on 400 series motherboards on socket LGA 1200. Uh, obviously, this will be dependent upon BIOS updates and all of that jazz, but it's looking like these processors are going to be fairly competitive. I'm hearing absolutely ridiculous things. I've recently covered um, performance numbers 
uh, of this the benchmarks and there are some reports that this thing is going to boost like 5.6 gigahertz which i'm a little skeptical of i mean maybe i'm wrong maybe we'll see six gigahertz for all i know uh, i don't have access to the engineering samples but i do think that uh Intel probably going to eke out wins in terms of gaming and some other bits, but is it going to be enough to convince people to go Rocket Lake? I don't know, because Zen is just so damn fast. Uh, and also, we've al already seen photos, of course, of the uh, Alder Lake, which is the 12900K, which has been leaked by um, videocards.com. They've already got engineering samples of this, and it's not launching, most likely, until the rumor is late next year, though it could maybe slip, but I think it's probably going to be late next year. That's going to be in an entirely different socket, LGA 1700, and it's a chunky boy, rather than being 37.5 by 37.5. So, yeah, kind of basically, well, yeah, it is a square, essentially. Um, this is 45 by 37.5, so it's basically a long boy. Um, so... That will be the 12th generation, and it will be Alder Lake. The final thing that I'll discuss today concerns the PlayStation 5, and the PS5 comes with a HDMI 2.1 cable. Honestly, I was somewhat reluctant to even cover this, because I think it's just kind of blinding the obvious, but there's still misinformation that's swirling around, despite the fact that people actually have the PS5 at this point. Um, there's a German website, GamePro.de. Uh, I don't natively read or speak uh, German, but Google Translate does a pretty spiffy job. And long story short, they said that they want to correct the misinformation regarding 2.1 cable of the PS5. Sony have confirmed to them that the cable inside is HDMI 2.1 standard, and the confusion arose from, well, the fact that the actual packaging of the cable was not labelled ultra-high speed, which is actually what 2.1 cables should be called. Instead, they were only labelled high speed, which would not represent the 2.1 standard. However, the actual cable itself is 2.1. So long story short, you don't need to worry about buying a PlayStation 5 and you have like a high refresh rate television and then you need to throw down the money to buy like a separate a separate cable which honestly would completely and utterly suck. Instead, you can utilize the cable that's given with you uh given with the system. And can we all appreciate just for a moment the we don't have to worry so much now about bloody connectors. Does anyone remember the times where you would buy like a console and you would get like an RF connection or maybe composite and then you would swear under your breath and then have to buy like um, something like S-Video or uh, RGB SCAR? <laughs> Just extra money on top of the money that you, that you ended up coughing up. But anyway, yeah, so you're good to go, pretty much. With all of that said, though, thank you very much for watching the video, the normal stuff. Like, share, comment, and subscribe. And I'll see you soon. Take care of yourselves. Bye for now.